Keir Sharma Sahib is from Kerala and he is a collaboration coach. He enables his clients to learn and cooperate, to collaborate with uh, through training, coaching and mentoring. He is an accredited meditator, mediator and mediation advocate, having received training from Indian Institute of Arbitration and Mediation Standards and Competencies in Mediation Advocacy in London and the Singapore Medi Mediation Center. He is sought after speaker in many social, intellectual and business forums, professional bodies besides schools and college university. He conducts workshops for business executives across levels, different levels, and represent companies in India and Oman and besides different schools. Uh, sure, he is also a good counselor to parents, uh, entrepreneurs, teachers and all. Sharma prefers to call himself as a collaboration coach because he believes that he enables managers, students, teachers, parents to learn and to cooperate and to collaborate. He has spoken on national and international conferences, summits, uh, uh, and a lot of credentials around. Uh, he is also a CEO of Life Skills Training India Private Limited, Chennai. Uh, it's a flagship program called NewGen which has been delivered for over a million student hours. He came keen Rotarian. We are fellow Rotarians and that's how I know him. He is a Rotarian since 92 uh, and uh, has held many positions in Rotary clubs. Uh, Mr. Sharma, welcome to you. Rotarian Sharma, welcome to you. And uh, we'd like to listen to you. Participants, uh, he has requested that this would be an hour and 75 minute session where in 25 minutes will be lecture 30 minutes uh, an activity which will help all of us improve our learning in terms of collaboration and marketing and next 15 minutes will be q and a session is that right sir ah, yes sir. thank you over to you sir <coughs> uh, thank you Just hold on sir i'll mute everyone so that you don't get disturbed no, thank you and i'll unmute you You want to? Uh, ah. I'll mute and I'll... Yes, sir. Can you unmute yourself, sir? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Rotarian Seshadri, for the kind words about me. Uh, good evening, my friends. It gives me immense joy to be in your midst this evening though virtually, and to interact with you, the entrepreneurs. I am one who believes strongly that the entrepreneur plays a very vital role in the society. I believe also that there can be heroism in the career of an entrepreneur. Parkinson and Rustam Ji had stated in one of their books, I quote, looking at the people in a city street, the missionary may say, I shall convert them to the true faith. The politician will say, I shall persuade them to vote for the right party. The revolutionary will say, I shall show them how to overthrow tyranny. The executives claim, I provided them with their underwear, may seem humble by comparison, mundane and almost laughable. But there are two points to note about the manufacturer's quiet remark. First of all, his claim is a matter of fact and not of opinion. He has done what he set out to do. The idealists claim that they mean to save the world, a promise for the future and one which they may or may not fulfill, while they merely promise the executive has already performed. In the second place, the maker of underwear has done people a good service and one which only a fool would question. No one has been compelled to purchase his product. Nobody is forced to wear them. All he has done is to make them available. And we should clearly be the worse off had he failed in his task. There is no such certainty about the idealist claim to our gratitude. How do we know that the doctrine preached is the true faith? How do we know that one political party is wiser than any other? How do we know that a revolution will not make things worse? At the end of his career, the manufacturer of underwear can claim to have worked very effectively in the cause of cleanliness, hygiene, and comfort. Can the idealist claim as much 
Can they in some instances claim anything at all? There are people in the world who will plunge society into bloodshed so as to bring about some future and doubtful utopia. There are people who throw bombs and commit air piracy in the name of this cause and that. The executive, the entrepreneur, by comparison, has been a general benefactor and has little reason to feel ashamed of himself. Promising a great deal less, he has done a great deal more. Nor has his task been a simple one. He has to transact business so as to satisfy his suppliers, his shareholders, his retailers, his employees, and the public at large. All are to benefit from his enterprise, and his work is incomplete until he has also satisfied the national government and the tax collector, the local government and rate collector, the trade associations and trade unions, the health inspector, and the chamber of commerce. In the world of free enterprise, the executive has to perform a daily miracle. He has to satisfy everyone, offering a good price for his raw material, announcing a fair dividend, paying good wages, and finally marketing an attractive product <coughs> at a price which people can afford to pay. If he can do all that, he has no reason to feel ashamed of himself. And that is the task to which the entrepreneur is committed. So if a missionary can be a hero, if a politician, a minister can be a hero, if a militant can be a hero, why not the entrepreneur? Yes, you the entrepreneur. Yes, we the entrepreneurs can claim to be heroes. There is heroism in the career of an entrepreneur. And the key factor that make the entrepreneur a hero is marketing. Because every organization, whatever be the nature of its activity, ultimately ends up in marketing a product or a concept or services. So in a, every organization is a marketing organization. Professor Stephen Bernard, every organization, uh, be it a business house or industry or an NGO, or a not-for-profit organization, or a temple, or a church, or mosque, is a marketing organization. Professor Stephen Bernard says, in a truly great marketing organization, you can't tell who is in the marketing department. Everyone in the organization has to make decisions based on the impact on the customer. In today's very highly <coughs> uh, volatile, transient, fast-changing, and disruptive environment, if an organization has to survive, if it has to justify its existence, if it has to sustain growth, everyone in the organization, irrespective of whatever function he is engaged in, whether he is an accountant or a production manager or a maintenance manager or a human resource manager or a finance manager has to make decisions based on the impact on the customer. In other words, the entire organization has to be customer focused. According to Dr. Philip Kotler, marketing calls upon everyone in the organization to think customer and to do all that they can to create and deliver superior customer value and satisfaction. Even if one is a professional, not working for any organization, but for himself, say an architect or an auditor or an advocate or a physician or any consultant for that matter, he too has to market his services if he has to be successful. So marketing concerns everyone. In the story of the greatest salesman in the world of Og Matino, Lord Jesus Christ appears in the dream of St. Paul and tells him even the word of God must be sold to the people or they will hear it not. <clears throat> so in a sense, what I am doing now is also selling. I am selling my speech to you. I am trying to convince all of you that the topic on which I am speaking is relevant to every one of you, regardless of the nature of your business or profession or occupation. Is salesmanship an art or a science? This question was put to me years ago, when as a young man, I had gone to attend an interview for a sales position more than half a century ago. <coughs> I answered that salesmanship was both a science and an art. The executive was interviewing me, further asked, why do you call it a science? And why do you call it an art as well? I replied, it's an art because 
like any other art, its scope is unlimited. And it is a science because like any other science, it works on basic axioms. It works on certain basic axioms. He did not ask me what were those basic axioms. One basic axiom I believe is that a marketing man should possess the willingness and the ability to see things from the customer's angle. He should possess an increased tendency to think always in terms of the other person's point of view. If there is any one secret of success at Henry Ford, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from his angle as well as from your own. Dale Carnegie says, thousands of salesmen are pounding the pavements today, tired, discouraged, and underpaid. Why? Because they are always thinking of only what they want. They don't realize that neither you nor I want to buy anything. If you did, we would go out and buy it. But both of us are eternally interested in solving our problems. And if a salesman can show us how his services or his merchandise will help us solve our problems, he won't need to sell us, we will buy. And the customer likes to feel that he is buying, not being sold. My father was a merchant in Trivandrum, having a few shops dealing in pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, groceries, stationery, etc. One day during my college days, I was sitting in one of the shops when a fashionable young lady came to buy egg shampoo. Unfortunately, or fortunately, egg shampoo was not available in the shop that day. So I told her that instead of egg shampoo, I could offer her some other shampoo available with us. The senior salesman of the shop then whispered in my ears that she was the daughter of so-and-so, a famous Malayalam novelist whose family members had been our customers for several years and that every time she or anyone else from her house bought shampoo from us, it used to be only egg shampoo and hence there was no use in my trying to sell her some other shampoo available with us. Somehow I felt confident and perhaps because I was young, I did not want to let go a beautiful young lady so soon. So I inquired her whether her hair was of dry nature or oily and told her that Hindustan liver had just then introduced three different types of shampoo to suit the three categories of hair, namely dry, greasy and normal. It is a simple fact that everyone's hair has to be either, either dry or oily or normal, as her hair, hair also naturally belonged to one of these three categories she bought from us, the shampoo meant for her particular hair. A few weeks after this incident, I happened to read what Roy Howard had said about selling. He said, salesmen should bear in mind that more mature men who have reached a certain point in business buy rather than are sold. A real salesman does not attempt to sell his prospect, but instead directs his efforts towards putting his prospect in a certain frame of mind so that he is moved to action by a given set of facts. <coughs> Professor Harry A. Overstreet, in his illuminating book, Influencing Human Behavior, says, action springs out of what we fundamentally desire. And the best piece of advice which can be given to would-be persuaders, whether in business, in the home, in the school, in politics, is first arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Dale Carnegie again says, this world is full of self-seeking people. So if on so if one unselfishly tries to serve others, he has an enormous advantage. He has little competition to face. And this is exactly where selling differs from marketing. The primary difference between selling and marketing is that selling focuses on the needs of the seller, whereas marketing focuses on the needs of the buyer. Selling is generally concerned with the plans and tactics of trying to get the customer to exchange what he has, that is money, and for what the seller has, that is goods and services. But marketing is concerned 
with the more sophisticated strategy of trying to have what the customer will want. Selling is only a confrontation between the buyer and the seller. Marketing is something much more than just persuading people to buy what we have. <coughs> selling is preoccupied with the seller's need to convert his products into cash. Marketing is preoccupied with the idea of satisfying the needs of the customer by means of the product as well as the whole cluster of customer value satisfactions associated with creating, delivering, and finally consuming or using the product. Marketing as a function includes all those activities concerned with the transfer of an organization's goods and our services. It therefore includes product planning, <coughs> Uh, uh, sale uh, advertising, sales promotion, selling, distribution, strategic planning, and product line innovation. In a broad sense, marketing includes research and development, R&D also. Let me reiterate that marketing is preoccupied with the idea of satisfying the needs of the customer. That is why perhaps an American author has described the art of marketing as similar to the art of kissing. He says, anyone can kiss a girl once, but the art is in being invited again. That she invites you to kiss her again is perhaps the only proof of your having performed it in a nice and graceful manner. It is the same with marketing. It is the first impression that my customer gets about me, about my company, its products and its services that runs up to long-term profits. A delighted customer becomes a permanent asset of the organization. The message from a happy or an unhappy customer spreads like coronavirus amongst the prospective buyers. So winning the delight of the customer is the right marketing strategy. But this is too often found to be ignored and neglected. I remember once uh, the Vipro Chair Professor of Marketing of the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore Professor P. N. Thirunarayana, jokingly remarking that kasht is the root word of customer in the Indian context. He said, jo kasht se marta hai, wo customer hai, yane customer hai. It means that one who dies due to problems is a customer. <coughs> Dr. Philip Kotler, <coughs> the world's leading authority on marketing says, marketing more than any other business function deals with customers. Creating superior customer value and satisfaction are at the very heart of modern marketing thinking and practice. <clears throat> marketing is the delivery of customer satisfaction at a profit. Dr. Philip Kotler further says, today's successful companies at all levels have one thing in common. They are strongly customer focused and heavily committed to marketing. They share an absolute dedication to understanding and satisfying the needs of customers in well-defined target markets. They motivate everyone in the organization to produce superior value for their customers, leading to increased levels of satisfaction. This statement, the last sentence I said of, of Dr. Peter, of uh, Philip Porter, answers the question, how to achieve customer satisfaction. Yes, an organization can achieve customer satisfaction only if its employees are happy and motivated. Frustrated employees tend to treat customers with indifference. So I would say, take care of your employees and they will take care of your customers. Again, Professor Thirunarayana says, the managing director's face must light up when he sees a salesperson and as a result, salespeople will start treating customers as personal guests. Strategy guru, the late uh, Dr. Sumantra Goshal of the London Business School said, worldwide managers are recognizing that while process re-engineering, financial restructuring, and strategic repositioning are important means to corporate renewal, the bedrock of competitiveness ultimately lies in the behavior of people. To stimulate initiative, trust, commitment, and cooperation within the organization and in its relationship with suppliers, regulators, customers, and others, top level managers are increasingly recognizing that the shaping and the embedding of organizational values are perhaps.
their most important personal challenges. So facing this challenge successfully will lead to customer delight. Customer orientation is very beautifully emphasized by Mahatma Gandhi in his famous words, which we find displayed in government undertakings. It reads thus, a customer is the most important visitor on our premises. He is not dependent on us, we are dependent on him. He is not an interruption on our work, he is the purpose of it. He is not an outsider to our business, he is part of it. We are not doing him a favor by serving him, he is doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to do so. <clears throat> no one can excel Mahatma Gandhi, no marketing man can excel Mahatma Gandhi, though he never wanted to be one. On the other hand, he avoided using any conventional tool of marketing or advertising. He avoided, he believed that uh, <clears throat> uh, influencing people or convincing people by the skill of language or through beautiful words was intellectual dishonesty. He told the people what he truly believed in and left them to accept it for the truth of it. The, his absolute faith in what he said reached the hearts of the people and influenced them. Dr. Napoleon Hill spent 20 years in research to discover the secret of success in life. And for this purpose, he interviewed 500 most successful men of America of his time, like Henry Ford, Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt, John D. Rockefeller, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Alva Edison, Andrew Carnegie, Scrabb, and so on. After all this study spanning long 20 years, he finally said, I quote, let us now consider the power of faith as demonstrated by a man who is well known to all of civilization, Mahatma Gandhi of India. In this man, the world had one of the most astounding examples known to civilization of the possibilities of faith. Gandhi wielded more potential power than any man living on this earth and this despite the fact that he had none of the orthodox tools of power, such as money, battleships, soldiers, and materials of warfare. Gandhi had no money, no home. He did not own a suit of clothes, but he did have power. How did he come by that power? He created it out of his understanding of the principle of faith and through his ability to transplant that faith into the minds of 200 million people. Gandhi accomplished the astounding feat of influencing 200 million minds to coalesce and move in unison as a single mind. What other force on earth except faith could do as much as Dr. Napoleon Hill. The relevance of Mahatma Gandhi in marketing is that a marketing man should believe strongly in what he is marketing. If he has no belief in what he is marketing, it is better he stops marketing that product. Because if he cannot persuade himself to believe, how can he persuade others to believe? Again, <clears throat> Dr. Napoleon Hill says, a master salesman never tries to sell anything in which he does not have implicit confidence because he's no, he knows that his mind will transmit his lack of confidence to the mind of the prospective buyer, regardless of how pleasing his presentation. Just as Mahatma Gandhi transplanted his faith in the minds of his countrymen, a good marketing man transplants his faith in his company and in its products and services in the mind of the buyer. A marketing man should have faith in himself, in his company, and in its products and or services. A marketing man, very importantly, should believe also that what his company is doing is beneficial to mankind. Peter Drucker, the father of modern management, says, executives in an organization must believe that its mission and task are the society's most important mission and task as well as the foundation of everything else. If they do not believe this, their organization will soon lose faith in itself, self-confidence, pride, and the ability to perform. So when a marketing man takes pride in what he is doing, takes pride in what he is marketing, he will develop an intimacy. And intimacy is at the heart of competence. This is what Max Dupree says, uh, Herman Miller, 
incorporated was considered to be during the last century one of the 10 best managed and most innovative companies of america his chairman and ceo max d pre has had written a book with the title leadership is an art the men who had greatly acclaimed this book include the former u.s president bill clinton and the greatest management gurus tom peters and peter Drucker. max d pre says in this book intimacy is at the heart of competence i repeat intimacy is at the heart of competence it has to do with understanding with believing and with practice it has to do with the relationship to one's work beliefs are connected to intimacy beliefs come before policies or standards or practices practice without belief is a forlorn existence managers who have no beliefs but only understand the methodology and quantification are modern day eunuchs they can never engender competence or confidence they can never be truly intimate functionally and technologically we are concerned with intimacy <clears throat> so a marketing man should have that intimacy with the products or services that he is marketing so the three axioms of marketing that we have seen so far are number one seeing things from the customer's angle number two a commitment to customer satisfaction and number three a belief in the soundness and usefulness of what one is marketing. The fourth axiom is that a marketing man should persist until he succeeds. He should persist not only for securing orders, not only for bagging orders, but more importantly, for winning the customer delight, for delivering <coughs> superior customer value and satisfaction. Og Matino has very beautifully driven home the importance of persistence in the career of a marketing man in one of the 10 scrolls of the greatest salesman in the world. I will present that scroll now. It's a very inspiring passage, slightly long. I may take around three to four minutes uh, to present it. I will persist until I succeed. In the Orient, young bulls are tested for the fight here in, in a certain manner. Each is brought to the ring and allowed to attack a picketer who pricks them with a lance. The bravery of each bull is then rated with care according to the number of times he demonstrates his willingness to charge in spite of the sting of the blade. Henceforth will I recognize that each day I am tested by life in like manner. If I persist, if I continue to try, if I continue to charge forward, I will succeed. I will persist until I succeed. I was not delivered unto this world in defeat, nor does failure course in my veins. I am not a sheep waiting to be prodded by my shepherd. I am a lion and I refuse to talk, to walk, to sleep with the sheep. I will hear not those who weep and complain, for their disease is contagious. Let them join the sheep. The slaughterhouse of failure is not my destiny. I will persist until I succeed. The prizes of life are at the end of each journey and not near the beginning. And it is not given to me to know how many steps are necessary in order to reach my goal. Failure I may still encounter at the thousandth step, yet success hides behind the next bend in the road. Never will I know how close it lies unless I turn the corner. Always will I take another step. If that is of no avail, I will take another and yet another. In truth, one step at a time is not too difficult. I will persist until I succeed. Henceforth, I will consider each day's effort as but one blow of my blade against a mighty oak. The first blow may cause not a tremor in the wood, nor the second, nor the third. Each blow of itself may be trifling and seem of no consequence, yet from childish stripes, the work will eventually jumble. So it will be with my efforts of today. I will be likened to the raindrop which washes away the mountain, the ant who devours a tiger, the star which brightens the earth, the slave who builds a pyramid. I will build my castle one brick at a time, for I know small atoms repeated will complete any undertaking. I will persist until I succeed. I will never consider defeat, and I will remove from my vocabulary such words and phrases as quit, cannot, unable, impossible, out of the question, improbable, failure, unworkable, hopeless and retreat from where, hopeless and retreat for they are the words of fools. I will avoid despair, 
But if this disease of the mind should infect me, I will work on in despair. I will toil and I will endure. I will ignore the obstacles at my feet and keep my eyes on the goals above my head. For I know where dry desert ends, green grass grows. I will persist until I succeed. I will remember the ancient law of averages and bend it to my good. I will persist with knowledge that each failure to sell will increase my chance for success at the next attempt. Each nay I hear will bring me closer to the sound of ye. Each frown I meet only prepares me for the smile to come. Each misfortune I encounter will carry in it the seed of tomorrow's good luck. I must have the night to appreciate the day. I must fail often to succeed only once. I will persist until I succeed. I will try and try and try again. Each obstacle I will consider as a mere detour to my goal and a challenge to my profession. I will persist and develop my skills as the mariner develops his by learning to ride out the wrath of each storm. I will persist until I succeed. Henceforth, I will learn and apply another secret of those who excel in my work. When each day is ended, not regarding whether it has been a success or a failure, I will attempt to achieve one more sale. When my thoughts beckon my tired body homeward, I will resist the temptation to depart. I will make one more attempt to close with victory. And if that fails, I will make another. Never will I allow any day to end with a failure. Thus will I plant the seed of tomorrow's success and gain an insurmountable advantage over those who cease their labor at a prescribed time. When others cease their struggle, then mine will begin and my harvest will be full. I will persist until I succeed. Nor will I allow yesterday's success to lull me into today's complacency, for this is the great foundation of failure. I will forget the happenings of the day that is gone, whether they were good or bad, and greet the new sun with confidence that this will be the best day of my life. So long as there is breath in me, that long will I persist. For now I know what are the greatest principles of success. If I persist long enough, I will win. I will persist. I will win. Unquote. All of you will persist and all of you will win. I will repeat the four axioms of marketing. Number one, seeing things from the customer's angle. Number two, a commitment to customer satisfaction. Number three, a belief in the soundness and usefulness of what one is marketing. And four, persistence. <coughs> uh, persisting until succeeding. Yes. Uh, with these words of uh, uh, inspiration from Og Mantino, I would like to conclude my talk. And we will now proceed to the experiential learning process. Uh, I will now conduct an activity in which all of you will participate. And from that uh, uh, experience, we will get some learning which are relevant to, to the axioms of marketing that we discussed just now. Uh, <clears throat> please wait a little. I will share the screen. In the meantime, if anyone would like to, uh, by the time I share the screen and open and all that, uh, to save the time, if anyone would like to put a question or say something, you can go ahead. So I'll request uh, uh, participants to put their questions in the chat box so that I can read it out and uh, ah. it might uh, save time and uh, uh, that's avoid right. any distractions. <clears throat> uh, there is a question from a gentleman. Uh, says in case of a pharma product which makes it sell is it a quality or a discount well, okay i will do one thing in that case uh, i will uh, answer the questions that then open the i want to share this thing yes uh, can you repeat the question i didn't hear because i was uh, there is someone who has asked that is it in case of pharma products uh, uh, what it make what makes it sell is it a quality or a discount uh, see, what <coughs> would make itself, whether quality or discount, may depend on the market, uh, the people. But uh, if you ask me uh, what should be done, quality should be the focus. Because by discount, there may be sometimes a short-term advantage, but in the long term, uh, quality is what will matter. Uh, I will give an example. I said uh, during the course of my speech that uh, 
uh, my father had a few shops. One of them was selling uh, pharmaceuticals. And one of his competitors, what he was doing was he would try to find out secretly the price at which uh, uh, <coughs> the drugs were sold in my father's shop. Because those days, this uh, printing the price on the uh, carton and all was not there. I'm talking about the 1960s, long, long ago. And then he will offer a little lesser than that. Then at the, during the same time, there was a crisis for some products which were in great shortage, particularly baby food and all that. And he was selling them as black market, uh, though there was a stipulation for the government that only at a particular price it should be sold. And uh, then people realized, because my father was an absolutely honest person, uh, he did not want to compromise anything uh, which would appear to be unethical. He was selling uh, baby food, uh, which was in short supply at the recommended price, and selling the drugs also at a reasonable price. Even when he heard that the other person was doing like that, he did not change his way. But in course of time, uh, people understood the genuineness of my father's shop. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, uh, I think the question answers is becoming more interesting. Mm. Can I complete that question answers? Ah, yes, yes. We but can maybe, have a uh, we yes. can have a workshop kind of a thing at a later date. Ah, yes. Because absolutely. we have now only 20 minutes. And ah, yes. my commitment to all participants is uh, eight to nine. So, ah, yeah. so okay. I'll 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 Good. request participants to put their questions in the chat box so that we are able to drive this and channelize this uh, QA. Uh, a gentleman called Manohar has asked a question. Where do you place relationship management? I repeat, where do you place relationship management in the pyramid of marketing and sales? How do we improve the overall relationship management with clients? Uh, in a sense, uh, marketing and relationship are synonyms because without relationship, there is no marketing and uh, uh, and how do we build the relationship how do we cultivate the relationship uh, determines the uh, success of a marketer uh, by focusing on understanding the needs of the customer and by focusing on meeting those needs he will build a relationship with the customer relationship is not simply uh, uh, exchanging pleasantries or giving gifts uh, uh, or sending such mails or communications. It is more about a commitment uh, to what the customer needs. Uh, the communication happens when the marketer is able to see things from the customer's angle, when he's able to understand what exactly the customer needs. See, many times what happens is what the customer says he wants is not exactly what he wants. So when you ask him, why do you want it? Then he will give an answer. Then you understand the true interest. And when you understand the true interest and try to address that, there will be a great joy and ecstasy for the uh, customer. And uh, that will build the relationship. Thank you. There is a question from a gentleman saying that uh, I have a lack of patience. Uh -huh. And that is why I could not succeed. That's Radha Raman Sharma from uh, Jaipur. He says, I have lack of patience and yeah. that is why I could not succeed. Yeah. Request to guide, how should I improve? Ah, yes. <laughs> it's a million dollar question. Uh, patience uh, really pays and persistence really pays. Both patience and persistence are interconnected. Uh, <clears throat> the, it's a very good question because we always say that we should be patient. But very rarely do we hear anybody saying, how to develop patients. So I congratulate you for asking this million dollar question. Uh, <clears throat> why do we lose patients? Uh, if we ask ourselves, we'll understand that we lose patients when things are not going in the way that we think should go. I go to a customer, suppose he gives the order, I'm happy. Suppose he makes me to meet him again and again and he is not placing the order, then I lose patience. The same is the case with anywhere. So when Things don't go the way in which we want them to go. We lose patience. The moment we understand that the way things are going is the way the things should go. And that is where my opportunity lies. Then we will have a positive mental outlook. For example, a customer says that uh, gives me an appointment. 
and I'm traveling 300 kilometers and going to meet him. And suddenly when I go to his office, he says he left only that morning for Jaipur because of some urgent work. Now there is every reason for me to get disappointed or angry or lose patience. But if I tell myself what Dr. Napoleon Hill said, in every adversity lies the seed of a greater benefit. I repeat, in every adversity lies the seed of a greater benefit. Then I will be able to reap that benefit from that adversity. Prima facie, it appears to be an adversity, but maybe something else in store is in store. Every problem carries with it the seed of a greater opportunity, says Deepak Chopra. And another thing is, uh, the way we lose patience is because we are imagining that a situation should be like this. And this is the ideal situation, which we never get. And when the situation is different, we are unhappy. On the other hand, if we look at the situation which we are facing as the situation which is offering, offering us great opportunities, then we will be happy. For example, I went to Jaipur, the customer had, sorry, I went to meet a customer traveling 300 kilometers, he had left for Jaipur. Now I can ask myself, what else can I do in this organization? Who, who are all the other people, key people? Maybe I will meet somebody in that organization who may give an input which the person whom I wanted to meet might not have given. So it has given me an opportunity. Or having gone to that place, I can I try to prospect and meet some other uh, customer who has a requirement which I can meet and I am getting another order. So we don't know uh, what is exactly in store. Wonderful. Uh, 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 so uh, if I can take a little time, I will uh, explain a situation from the Bhagavad Gita. Shall I do that? Uh, yes. yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, the activity is not there, so I hope there will be enough time. See, you know, in the Kurukshetra battlefield, Arjuna lost patience, eh? as you said. He developed frustration. He developed self-pity. Before the war was to start, he looked at the war front and he saw his uh, forefathers and teachers whom he greatly revered and respected and many blood relations. So he felt very depressed. And he felt that he was very unfortunate. That is why he was driven to fight a war as the one he was facing. So he told Lord Krishna, uh, I'm suffering. Uh, I, I will recite the Sanskrit sloka and interpret the meaning. He told Lord Krishna, Karpanya dosho pakatasopava, Prichami tvam dharma samuda cheta, Yetreyasyan nishchitam bruhi danme, Sishyasteham shadi maptvam prabhanna. I am suffering from Karpanya dosha. What are the meanings of Karpani Dosha could be self-pity? Right? I am very unfortunate. That is why I have been driven to fight such a bloody war as the one I am going to face now. Then Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, no, you are not unfortunate. He says, Yadirchaya Chopapannam Surgadvaram Apavrutham Sukhina Kshatriya Partha Labhande Yuddham Idrisham Yadirchaya Chopapannam See, this Yadrachaya, the, uh, the accidentally this war has rather taken place. It's not hell as you are thinking, but Swargatvaram Apavradam. It is heaven with doors open. And you said you are unfortunate. No, Sukhina Kshatriya Partha, only a fortunate Kshatriya, a fortunate warrior like Arjuna will be made to face such a war as the one you face now. See, something that Arjuna looked as hell, Krishna tells him that is not hell, it is heaven with doors open. And he explains why it is heaven with doors open. He says, Hatova prapsasi surgam, jitvava bhokshase mahim, tasmad uthishta kamteya yudhaya krita nishcheya. In this war, only one of the two things will happen. Hatova prapsasi surgam. You will be killed in this war, in which case you will go to the heaven reserved for brave warriors. Another possibility is you will win this war, in which case you will rule, rule this hell. So in both the cases, you start to gain. So how do you say it is hell? It is heaven, because there are only two results, and both the results will put you in a great level than where you are now. Then he says a few other things, and then Arjuna gets enlightened, and he thanks Lord Krishna for enlightening him. He says, Nashto moha smritir labda tot prasadhan maya chuta sthithos mi all my illusions are gone, doubts are dispelled. Now I am firm, I will do as you advise. And he started to fight the war, and you know how it led, he won the war. So 
Any situation that we face is heaven with doors open. Whether it is heaven or hell will be determined by our attitude. That is why Professor William James, one of the greatest psychologists of the 20th century said, attitudes are more important than facts. The attitude that Arjuna had was it is hell. The attitude that Krishna had, which he was able to confer on Arjuna was that it is heaven. The moment he started looking at it as heaven, things changed. So in every adversity, there is a seed of a greater benefit. To drive home this point, I will say also one story which truly happened in America about 85 years ago. There lived a farmer who had a large wheat farm and he also had a large family to support. He was toiling in the field from morning till night and uh, still he was earning just enough to make both ends meet. He was not able to save even a penny. So one day he thought, what is this? I am working very hard from morning till night and I am having such a large farm and I don't waste money. He is very thrifty also. But even then, I am not able to save any amount, any money. This should not be the case. There should be a bright idea, implementing which I should be able to enhance the income from my field. And as a result, I'll be able to save money. And he set a target that in five years' time, I will become a multi-millionaire. Within three days of his deciding to do so, he had a paralytic attack. And the doctor told him that he would be bedridden for one year. So the man started wondering, see, even when I am toiling in the field from morning till night, I'm earning just enough to make both ends meet. Only three days ago, I thought that even that income is not sufficient. Now it appears even that will not be there. So what will happen to my family? How will I feel? But he was a believer. So that night before going to sleep, he prayed to God. He told God, Oh God, doctor tells me that I'll be bedridden for one year. He must be right because he's a learned, trained and experienced medical professional. But I know one thing, there must be a bright idea, implementing which I should be able to earn enough lying on the bed like this for one year, uh, <coughs> like, like this for one year and uh, to make both ends meet, why even make some progress towards achieving my goal of becoming a multi-millionaire in five years time. See, even at that condition, he was not forgetting his goal. So he had a sound sleep, very good sleep. Would anybody get sleep in that condition? But he had a very peaceful sound sleep because he believed that next day morning, God would give him that bright idea, implementing which he would earn enough lying on the bed for one year. Next morning, he woke up very fresh and he had got that bright idea. He summoned all the members of his family and explained to them the idea. The idea was this. He told them, See, I have worked very hard to bring the farm to this level. In another two months is the time for harvest. Somehow take care of the farm for two months. <clears throat> take the harvest, sell the harvest, collect the money and clear the field. Thereafter, don't grow wheat anymore because growing wheat involves a lot of work. Uh, tilling the soil, manuring, watering, etc. All of you are going to school. You won't have time to do that. So what you do is you clear the field and go to the agricultural market and buy uh, two pounds, uh, a little less than one kilogram of a particular seed, I forgot the name, go to the field and sprinkle the seed all through the field and come away. You need not do anything else thereafter. Go there after three weeks and you will see that the seeds have sprouted into small plants. Go there again after three weeks, they would have, sprout, they would have become big plants. Again, go there after three weeks, the whole farm would look like a forest, like a bush, because those plants grow very fast like wild plants. At that time, you will see they're yielding the same corn which you had sprinkled. And that corn is the feed for pigs. At that time, you buy a pair of pigs, a male pig and a female pig, and leave them and come. And then go there after a few weeks, you will see a lot of piglets, young pigs, because pigs multiply very fast. And the pigs get enough food because uh, these plants are yielding the corn which is their feed. And when the pigs are young, cut them and sell the tender pig meat because tender pig meat is very tasty. I don't know. I am a pure vegetarian. Okay. Let us not think about whether selling, uh, cutting uh, young pigs, piglets is right or wrong. That is a different story. Let us get only the moral of this story. So the family started doing that. And after two months, they realized that they were earning more than what the father was earning, toiling in the field from morning till evening. And the demand for this tender pig meat was growing in the district. And even for the neighboring districts, there were inquiries. They were not able to cope up with the demands. And after another 
uh, four months, the income was double and the income was almost touching triple when the man recovered from paralysis. He never went back to wheat farming. He expanded his pig farm. And in a span of three years, his brand of tender pig meat became popular in most parts of America and he became a multimillionaire. So I repeat, attitudes are more important than facts. The fact is that he was bedridden and hence he cannot work and hence he cannot earn. And because it was a fact, it was not important. His attitude that there must be a bright idea implementing which I should be able to earn enough lying on the bed like this for one year made the difference. Wonderful. So when we internalize this, we will not lose patience. Thank you. So uh, Sharma sir, hmm. what I'll do is, uh, hmm. can we have a rapid fire question? Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, right. okay. I have about six questions and I have about six minutes to you know. Hmm. So I'll ask a question. Hmm. You can give answer in one line. Uh, yes. Right. I will first try. question from Ravi Shankar from Bangalore. Hmm. He says, why the marketing people are rewarded while the operation managers who give the quality are ignored? Because in the case of marketing, it is visible, whereas operation, it is not visible. Thank you. The next question is from Prasad Desraj from Mumbai. Is customer delight doing something extra than actual requirements, which may achieve satisfaction? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Does customer delight mean doing extra hmm. than uh, what is expected? Yes. Is what uh, question? Uh, <clears throat> customer delight is doing more than what the customer expected you to deliver. It's true. Okay. Right. The next question is from Amit Verma from Ahmedabad. I have lost some new customers for my services because I could not gauge how much they can pay. I just asked for what I can get best. What should be the strategy? Uh, the question he, is that they could not uh, pay. He, he, yeah, he could not gauge the customer's uh, you know, paying capabilities. Yeah. Uh, so how gauging, do you gauge? Yeah. Uh, see, one becomes a customer only when he pays for the services of the product. So mm -hmm. gauging the capacity of the customer to pay is very important when we finalize the contract. Thank you. Sumati from Kuwait, she says, how to focus on sustenance in sales and marketing? How do you focus on sustenance? By continuity of adding customers. Yeah, by, uh, by continuing to innovate and uh, uh, continuing to understand how the market dynamics works and meeting the requirements uh, uh, from time to time. Yeah. Because what meets the customer's requirement today may not meet it tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Sheshara says, uh, Sheshara from Hyderabad, in service sector, in this competitive world, what is your best way to succeed? Your advice, please. In service, service, service uh, sector. Uh, in, uh, in the service sector, the scope of service is even more because there is no product, it is only service. So understanding the needs of the customer and meeting it is very important. For okay. example, a software product may be great, but it may not meet the customer's requirement, so it doesn't serve the purpose. Thank you. Rahul Sharma from Chandigarh. Shouldn't quality managers be given charge of marketing since quality is at forefront of endorsing product and services? Your views, please. Uh, should quality, sorry, first sentence? Shouldn't, shouldn't be the quality managers be given a charge of marketing? Quality See, managers uh, be given a charge of marketing. Yeah. See, there is a wrong notion that marketing is only uh, selling, distribution, and advertising and all that. Marketing in function includes all those activities concerned with the transfer of an organization's goods and our services. It therefore includes quality and very much. Thank you so much. Now, another question uh, from Mr. Mahendra Hyderabad. Business and services are dependent on customer only. Best said, sir, as this is the only basis for any business globally. While we market the product basis on based on this axioms, customer knowing that this product might suit him better than some comfort level stuff. How do we maneuver such vision? I have not understood the question, Mr. Mahindra. I too haven't understood. Yeah, leave it late. Uh, there is a question uh, from Kavita Balakrishnan. Can you define satisfaction? Uh, beautiful. Uh, when you get what you expected to get, you are satisfied. Wonderful. 
Uh, and you are delighted when you get more than what you expected to get. And there is another question from her. What is the mantra of customer retention? Uh, customer delight. Continued customer delight. There is one Rotarian, uh, former assistant commissioner of Kendra Vidyalaya Sangatan, IIT campus, Chennai, uh, Usha Rani. She is asking a question to you that how do you memorize these paras and all? Uh, in the course of my, uh, this, uh, shall I take uh, uh, two minutes to answer? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, the speech I quoted Max T. Pre, where he says intimacy is at the heart of competence. My intimacy with those thoughts made me to read them again and again and keep thinking about them and reciting them to myself. Uh, and as a result, they became my own. Because many of these uh, you know, things that I quoted, I did not learn for the purpose of delivering a speech. When I was a functional business manager for solving my problems, I learned all these things. I walked the talk first and then started talking. Thank you. Thank you. So my last question, and uh -huh. as I close, uh, where should an organization focus? Who should focus more on internal customers and who should focus more on external customers? That's a question from my side. Uh, internal you, customers and yeah. external customers. So who should focus is what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, in a sense, everyone should focus on both. I will give an example from my uh, practical life. I had a long career in the field of industrial marketing for over 26 years. Once uh, my boss told me uh, when one of uh, my colleague sales engineers complained that uh, the accounts department is not uh, cooperating or the stores manager is not cooperating. Then he said, this was a time when the concept of internal customer was not there. I'm talking about 1970s. He said, see, like you are trying to impress the uh, customer outside, you consider these people also, you need to win their cooperation. So you consider this also as part of your business. Eh? Like you have to convince a customer and get the order. It is also your business to convince the accountant and get the voucher passed or get uh, your travel uh, passed or whatever it is. So internal customer and external customer, when all the people should be groomed uh, to win the satisfaction. And when they do that, the, it will be sustainable. It is not that one person alone doing. It is uh, a culture that has to be developed. And this culture, you know, seeing things from others' angle, uh, I, as I quoted Henry Ford, if there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from his angle. So kindly unmute yourself, sir. Uh, by a mistake, I uh, muted you. Kindly unmute you. Yeah. Uh, see, as a sales engineer, when I go to the accountant to for some sanction, and he has some objection, if I view it from his angle, I will be able to understand why he says so. And then I will be able to find a solution to solve the problem and do it in a, a different manner. So we need to train all the people in the organization uh, in this culture of seeing things from others' perspective. Thank you, Sharma, sir. Mm -hmm. So, friends, it was a wonderful session. I believe uh, all of you have enjoyed. I see a comment coming from a senior uh, respected professional, Sri Ram Natarajan Garu from Chennai. He says, very good session, Sharma Garu. Thank you so much. A lot of insights. Anybody else? I have unmuted all of you. You can unmute. You can, uh, you know, you can talk. You can share your feedback. So where can, where can I get access to the recording of this lovely session, sir? My name is Amin Merchant. Is it? I from think where, I, I, uh, I'm from, I'm, from? I'm from Mumbai. I've been listening to Mr. K.S. Sharma on various webinars on mediation. So I'm actually a certified professional mediator. Uh, your yes, good sir. name, please. Uh, your good name. Sir, my name is Amin Merchant. Amin oh, Merchant. Hello, how are you, Amin? <laughs> thank you. I'm very well, thank you, sir. And how are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. It's a uh, pleasure I, to hear you on this subject. I, yeah, I think I have, I have those who want recording. I have uh, uh, put my number in the chat box. Please send me a WhatsApp tomorrow morning. I'll send the recording. To so kind of you, sir. So just so a second. I'll there just is note Mohammed that. Atisham saying excellent session, sir. Very informative. Shivakumar saying excellent speech. I'm able to recall Kotler. 
anybody else would like to say anything to sharma sir sir yeah usha madam here sir sharma sir namaste uh, namaste mera uh, 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 why can't you put my video i have I'll, i've done that now madam yes yeah thank you sir uh, thank you <laughs> see thank you, you remember i have your student <laughs> in the training session ृष्णर Hello, how are you? I'm fine. How, how are you, Kavita? Uh, great, ah, uh, great to hear you again. Ah, uh, yeah, and thank you very much for attending. Yeah, yeah, I should thank you for this wonderful <laughs> session. Anybody yeah. else would like to share? It was really a warm session for everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Anybody and, else uh, would like to share? Uh, Rotarian Shesha Dri, uh, uh, Kavita Balakrishnan is a leading mediator of Chennai. Uh, leading mediator, mediator. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, thank Kavita. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Without a recording, we would have lost gold. <laughs> Shishadri Sahab, I still haven't got your number on the chat. If you can help me, I'll be grateful. If you can put it on the chat, your number, I'll, your mobile I'll, number. I'll, again, I'll repeat that: nine eight four nine zero eight two five two zero. Nine eight. Happy to share. Nine eight four nine zero. Yes. Eight two five two zero. Eight two five two zero. Thank you, sir. See, I am getting such gold uh, for all of you every Tuesday from eight to nine. It is uh, expected of all of you to come and take benefit of. It's all free of cost, and if you want recording, I'm making it available on YouTube shortly, so that. And uh, I have posted. Uh, I have in the chat box. I have posted my mobile phone and WhatsApp number. Yeah. Anybody else would like to share experience with uh, Sharma? Sir, Sir I am Radhami Sharma from Jaipur. Uh, yes. Sir, good evening. Thank you very much for explaining about the patience. I am really delighted by your motivational speech and your your explanation. Really thankful, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And you can save my mobile number, WhatsApp number, and uh, to become uh, to develop patience, I can guide you. Feel free to contact me. Wonderful. I can yes, give sir, you. Yes, sir. I will. Uh -huh. I will take from Sesadri, sir. And uh, thank you very much, sir. Once again, That's... anybody else would like to share experience to Sharma sir? Because that is one way we can thank him. Because uh, you know, expressing gratitude is one art. You know, I want you, each one of you, to you know, some of you at least, to share your. Yes. And excuse me, before I forget, I want to uh, thank Rotarian Seshadri profusely for giving me this opportunity. Oh, That's okay, sir. Sir, this is Manohar speaking. I'm from Hyderabad. I work at ICICI Bank, uh -huh. and this is a real nice opportunity to be a part of your session, sir. Uh -huh. This is really enriching and enlightening. And uh, the way you are articulating about the customer experience and the way we need to take things forward for the organizations, this is really overwhelming. I'll make sure that what are the learnings that are uh, taken from this class, uh, I'll be implementing on the ground, and we'll definitely come back with the results and uh, you know your uh, inputs again in. Uh, making myself grow much better see one of the thing ways you can really thank him is get him speak to your team members you know and especially in bank so it will have a larger impact on the customers yes uh, certainly sir i actually shared this entire uh, this uh, zoom link everything uh, in a very short notice basically so that's the reason why my teammates couldn't join uh, but i'll but share the recording with you i'm sure and all these people will come and yeah Have him for your team because yeah, sir, the gem of a person. Yeah, definitely, sir. Uh, Ravi Shankar from Bangalore, sir. Mm -hmm. It is a, a wonderful session, sir. Actually, a lot of uh, takeaways from your speech, sir. Actually, I would rather inculcate uh, in my personal life as well as my. Uh, I would rather uh, try to influence uh, my friends as well as my colleagues, sir. Okay, thank thank you. you, sir. Thank you very uh, much. Sir. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. it was a very good session, and really, you brought in a lot of positive vibe into this marketing field, which normally is very painful. 
but there's so much of uh, diversified thoughts you brought in. It was great. So great. Hats off to you. That was Vijay Lakshmi from Bangalore. Vijay Lakshmi from Bangalore. Yes. yes. Thank you, Mr. Jai. Good evening, sir. This is Sunil Kumar from Manchuria. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful session and lot of uh, examples with the short stories. It was very nice experience with you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. We lot. Uh, we learn a lot. Thank you. Thank you, so, sir. Thanks. Uh, sir, so, yeah, yeah, anecdotes were very good, sir, actually. Yeah. yeah, anecdotes were very good, actually. And your uh, <laughs> uh, uh, stories from Mahabharata and all were very good, sir, actually. Uh, yeah. Wonderful, sir. Uh, can I request Mr. Sriram Natarajan also to share his uh, insight, learnings, feedback? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening and... Uh, Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Your session was really good. In fact, I underwent uh, sales training from uh, Mercury Goldman uh, from a Swedish company in 2000. And there they, they used the same words. What is selling? Generating a need is all about selling. It is not trying to overwhelm uh, with a product or a service to a customer. And then they use the word like delightful, delightful customer. So, I'm very happy. The mind is refreshing. What all I learned 10 years before, now you are giving me a fresh thought to <laughs> all this. Rekindling my memory. Thank you very much for thank the session. So and and uh, thanks to Mr. Sheshadri for arranging this. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So with that note, uh, I'd like to say goodbye to all of you. And uh, namaste, Sharma, sir. Thank you so uh, much for your thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice, that you have arranged such a beautiful session thank with Sharma, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, so many people getting benefited. I am excited about it. Thank you so much. Yeah, surely. Thank you. Such a, such a fantastic you. session we had. Thank you. So much. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good night. This Thank day, you. sir is arranging good talks and all interactions. We are enjoying a lot. Thank, Thank you so much. Sir. And all different aspects. And today's uh, Sarma Sars uh, is a real wonder for me again. <laughs> uh, it was such a beautiful session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, good everybody, night. for the good interactions uh, also. Uh, I will, uh, good night. Uh, those who want to contact me, I will give my number again. Double yes. nine, double nine, four eight, double four. Yeah, in the chat, it is there. A uh, chat I had put once, yes. Double nine, four eight, double four, double zero, double nine. I will repeat, double nine, four eight, double four, double zero, double nine. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good, uh, good night. Thank you, sir. Good, good, good night. night. Good, good night, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shriyadri Garu. Good night. Thank you, Manor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shriyadri Garu. Thank you, so thank, you Shishadri, uh, thank you, sir, for giving us a wonderful good opportunity for all for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, giving yeah, yeah. Good, good classes for our business and personal life. I learned so, thank you very much. That's the reason I keep organizing this. <laughs> thank good you, sir. Night. For considering well, to us to learn. For considering us to learn with, <laughs> along with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Nice evening, sir. Bye, Andy. Bye. See you. Bye, everybody. Tomorrow, rotary meeting in the evening. Yeah, yeah. I'll let you. Surely.